So it brings me great pleasure to welcome you to the College of Humanities and Social Sciences in Hamad bin Khalifa University in Qatar to celebrate World Day of Social Justice, a day that promotes tackling important issues such as poverty, inequality, gender inequality, and human rights in general. Without further ado, it brings me great pleasure to welcome our distinguished panelists here to talk about contemporary sports issues, accessibility, and uh, women's rights. Uh, first off, we have HBKU's own PhD candidate and the International Relations Manager in the Committee of Legacy, the committee that's bringing us FIFA 2022, Sheikha Najwa Al-Thani. Welcome, Sheikha. <laughs> Our next panelist is the first Qatari woman to ever hear the words, you are an Iron Man. In mere eight months, she went from being a crossfitter to hearing those words, you are an Iron Man, in Hamburg last year. Welcome, Lula Murray. <laughs> Our next panelist is two-time Olympian, the first Qatari woman to hold the Qatar flag in 2012 uh, Rio Games, and the distinguished uh, Secretary General of Qatar's Athletes Commission, Nada. <laughs> Our next panelist has taken part in marathons in Qatar, Oman, Kuwait, and Jordan. The first para athlete to cross Qatar from north to east, west, and south. Oh, please welcome Ahmed Shahrani. <laughs> next panelist is the, fair, is the first Arab man to reach the summits of both Mount Everest and Mount Laos during the same expedition. An achievement less than 85 people all, all around the world can lay claim to. While doing so, he placed Qatar's flag on the highest peaks in the world, Mr. Fahed Badar. <laughs> Our next panelist is Senior Disability Sports Specialist here at Qatar Foundation, Mr. Ryan Moynard. <laughs> Last but certainly not least, our final panelist is project coordinator of the football commentary training program here in TII, Ms. Rama Zabi. Thank you. <laughs> to our audience at home, we invite you to participate actively in the webinar Q&A where, we'll, where we will be relaying all of your questions live during the panel. And now I would love to welcome Dr. Amal, the founding dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. Good evening, everyone. I need to look at the camera. Good evening and welcome to uh, our celebration at the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at Hamad bin Khalifa University of World Day of Social Justice. It also gives me great pleasure to welcome the excellent panel uh, of speakers we have today, heroes and heroines of our community. I hope all of you enjoy this fantastic event and benefit from the fruitful conversation that will be led by Dr. Jazia Nafesh, Professor and Associate Dean uh, for Social Engagement and Access at the College. At the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, we are driven by our commitment and belief in social justice as we strive to be agents of change both educators and uh, students, while working collaboratively with other social actors and partners to achieve our goal. We focus in our celebration today on contemporary uh, sports issues, accessibility, and women's rights. Since 2022 is a key year for sports here in Qatar, the first Arab nation to host the FIFA World Cup. Later this year, inshallah, we believe that discussing issues and efforts relating to the topics of accessibility and women's rights in the field of sports is at the heart of our research mission in the college, as we believe that we can contribute proactively to pave a pathway to more inclusive and accessible experience. The beauty of sport is that it has a unique power to rely uh, to relay important messages, foster cultural inclusion and acceptance, and bridge the divides that may exist in the society. We believe that promoting fairness equality in all aspects of our lives is a responsibility each one of us must stand up to in order to ensure that all members of our communities are not left behind or disadvantaged or worst harmed. So without further ado, I will hand the floor to our moderator, uh, Professor Gisilia, and let us all enjoy and engage with uh, all of our heroes and heroines today. Thank you so much, Dr. Gisilia. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Ramal, for hosting this event on such a special occasion. Uh, we are all here today to celebrate the International Day when we should all be thinking about social justice, 
equity, creating um, the ideal conditions for all mankind, womankind, all people to be part of society in a healthy, um, complete way. I'm honored to be here with you today. Uh, we have an excitement, a very exciting alignment of topics that will be discussed by our panelists. And I think we are ready to begin. Thank you all for being here. And we are looking forward to the questions that those who are taking part are in different places in Qatar and abroad. Um, please tell us what you think, ask questions to our panelists, and we will be here to provide you possible answers. With no further ado, um, I suggest we start. And because this is the year that we are celebrating sports at a world level in Qatar with the upcoming FIFA uh, Football World Cup, our first question has to be connected to the topic. And I would address um, Ms. Najwa Thani. Uh, would you please let us know what it means to Qatar to be hosting such an important sports event, both as a welcoming country and a country that shows resilience in the moment when COVID is striking, the world is stressing, and we are celebrating the joy of sport. Yes, for sure. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for hosting us here tonight. I'm sure I, I very much look forward to uh, this panel and to hearing the experiences of the other panelists that are here. So not only is this very significant for Qatar as a country, but as Dr. Evan rightfully mentioned, this is also the first World Cup in the Arab world um, and the Middle East more broadly. And it's only the second World Cup to come to Asia. So it is a huge a moment in history for us as a country, but also for us as a region, to be hosting this World Cup. And, and we have understood from the first day the potential uh, that, that comes with this to drive social change um, in the country, the region, and in the world, hopefully. And as you can see from my organization, the Supreme Committee for Delivery and Legacy, in establishing it, we have made it a priority to ensure a strong legacy for this World Cup. Um, now, as a country, and, and not uh, directly to the discussion of, of our topic today, but we are ready to host the World Cup. And this is for the first time that a year in advance, all of the infrastructure is ready. We are privileged to have a, a huge test event like the FIFA Arab Cup. And one of the main things that came out of that is not only to showcase to the world what a very passionate football crazy uh, region, the Arab world is more broadly, but it also shows how football and sports have the chance to engage um, a very, to, to attract a very engaged audience. So we had over 450 million people tune in to watch the Arab Cup. Um, and this amazing achievement just goes to show you that this is a platform, a platform for conversation, a platform for people to people diplomacy, a platform to bridge cultural uh, differences to correct misconceptions that people may have about the country and the region. We all know some of the images about the Middle East worldwide. So this is an opportunity for people to come down here and to see the region for what it truly is and to see um, and, and to not only correct those misconceptions and stereotypes, but also to make an impact and, and actually showcase what we have to offer uh, as a region. COVID as well has not been a great time for the entire world. Um, we hope that we would be the first post-pandemic celebration for the entire world where everyone can come. The nature of the World Cup has everyone in one area. Um, it's the first compact World Cup where whoever is here and experiencing one day for everyone else in one space. Um, and so we hope that in an increasingly polarized world, in a world with increased difficulties because of the pandemic, that this will truly be a celebration of everyone's joint humanity, hopefully, inshallah, um, at the end of the year. We are sure it's going to be a wonderful event and we are all engaged as a community to make it truly a welcoming country and place to the world. Um, I will be using this idea of holding flags throughout our first conversation. Qatar will be holding flags uh, of all different countries in the world, different fans, different people, and we will be holding these flags high 
in respect for diversity, in respect for cultural differences, in respect for humanity. We go back to we will be a group of different people celebrating sports and celebrating friendship. Taking the notion of flying our flags as athletes that we have in the room, um, you have been flying our flag high and feeling proud when you take the flag to the peak uh, of um, the highest peaks uh, on the globe. And I now would like to address Mr. Farhad Badar. Um, you have definitely placed Qatar's flag very high up, very close to the sky. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your personal journey? Um, how have you become this athlete taking the Qatari flag to the highest peaks? I have been uh, a fan of nature and I loved hiking and I loved going into adventure since my childhood. But I think a few years back I decided that I need to pursue my dream to climbing the highest mountains in the world. It was not easy coming from a country that's actually flat. It's a desert, you know, and the idea of someone climbing mountains where it's either in the Himalayas or the Alps, you know, coming from a desert, it looked very strange. Even preparing, training, getting the resources, getting the information was very challenging. However, for me, I found passion, and uh, like with every climber, one of the first three mountains I climbed was Kilimanjaro, which is typically the first mountain that any mountaineer go there. there. And then this is like, was a trip of one week where I was tired, I was uh, sick, I was not feeling well, I was struggling. However, I felt like it's in my place. I loved the experience. I loved the challenge. I loved being there. After climbing that mountain and reaching the summit, which was not easy, although for now, maybe with hindsight, it was one of the easiest mountains I climbed, it, it, it changed my life perspective. And since that time, I wanted to do a lifelong dream, which was climbing Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world. And because of that, I had to go to climbing other mountains. But the thing is about climbing mountains, it's not about the journey itself. It's about how you prepare for that journey, which meant life commitment, daily commitment in terms of your schedule, in terms of your training, in terms of your food, but also in terms of your mentality. Like, for example, preparing for a race like such as uh, a marathon or a triathlon or anything, you end up a race in a day. While in mountaineering, sometimes you race take two months. And it's not only doing the race itself, but it's living there, living at altitude. Eating food that's not prepared by a chef, you know, sometimes dry food. Staying in a very harsh condition that usually people don't live there. But for me, I loved it. And I met people who are as crazy as me, who loved living in those harsh conditions, which we collect. And usually in mountaineering, you find the great, craziest mount, uh, people in the world, which we love it. You know? So I think this is where I feel alive the most, on mountains and high peaks. Your smile tells us that that's where you really feel happy. Yeah, this is where I want to go now. Excellent. He will be going back soon, inshallah. Um, and still talking about carrying flags. Uh, Ms. Nada Wafa, um, you have taken the flag underwater and to bring it out at the other end and again raise uh, the Qatari flag as an Olympic swimmer. Could you also please tell us a little about your career? How did you get where you are? Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Um, so it's been a, a long and really inspiring journey for me. Um, I started at the age of nine um, at a small local club called Vital Waves, and from that moment I realized how much I um, loved the sport, swimming, and um, you know, I was very uh, dedicated and passionate, and I just loved being in the water, um, you know, and it made me so happy. So that's how it all started. Um, and then I continued throughout the years, and of course, um, uh, my father was a uh, famous goalkeeper uh, for Qatar, so he was always there um, to inspire me and, um, uh, you know, to talk to me about his experiences and, you know, teach me such valuable lessons as well as my mother. Um, so supportive throughout. Um, friends and family 
Um, so yeah, it's been quite an interesting journey. And then in 2011, um, they, uh, my father, the, the international team said, uh, we want um, you to be able to start um, swimming uh, for the national team. So, you know, once I heard about that news, I was very excited uh, and very happy. And that's how I started my journey with the Qatar national team. And, and the 2011, and my first ever biggest competition was uh, the 2011 Arab Games. Um, and then a year after, I also uh, received a call saying that, um, you know, there's a lot of Olympics coming up, and we want you to prepare for that. And it got me thinking about the 2008 Olympics, actually, when I was watching it with my family, and we were you know, obviously watching the swimming events. Uh, and I, I remember telling you, though, I remember it quite clearly in my head that, um, you know, my dream is to participate in the Olympics. You know, I would love for that to happen. But I never gave up on my dream. Uh, I worked on it throughout the years, and then it came true in 2012. Um, so being there at the uh, London Olympics, at the opening ceremony, it was so, so inspirational and I was very proud and to make history to be the first female summer to participate. And uh, just being there at the opening ceremony, holding with the pottery flag up high, it was just really such a surreal moment for me. And especially uh, my race as well, standing behind the blocks, all these emotions um, that I was going through. I was excited, I was happy, I was nervous, but um, of course I couldn't have done it without uh, my uh, family, my friends, and other than team that was doing the committee and just everyone there. So that's how it happened. And then four years after, we had the uh, Rio Olympics. Um, and then I'm continuing with my journey right now, and it's honestly wonderful. Excellent. Um, we've heard the word love, inspiration, uh, dream. So clearly, and hard work. Uh, clearly, these are ingredients for success. And moving on to another successful woman. Uh, you too have raised the Kazoo flag. Um, I am raised. Could you tell us a little bit more about this? Uh, Ironman is a uh, race of three sports altogether. It's a uh, endurance sport. You start with swimming uh, 3.8 kilometer, and then you fight for 180 kilometer, and then you run a marathon. So <laughs> I feel emotional talking about raising that flag because um, uh, I was debating whether I should carry a flag to my finish line or not because I wanna like uh, I wanna make my country proud of me and I wanna have a good number and uh, I think I changed my mind a uh, few days like two days before my uh, birthday. I saw a speech saying, don't seek perfection. And there is never a perfect moment. We all start somewhere. So if I'm going to raise my flag on my first race, uh, and it's not the perfect number, I didn't raise excellent, I would probably raise my flag to show people that we can all start somewhere. Um, your journey starts on, uh, on your first race. And we are going to be proud of you regardless. And that's what happened. I'm raising a flag on my first race, and I have nothing but hot condition behind me. Uh, I did get some uh, negative uh, people coming on me, but I think uh, I'm far from my job, and I'm ready to break my flag to all my next competition. <laughs> Inshallah, this year I will erase with my heart. So I, I cannot express my feelings. Get goosebumps because um, I mean, it's a responsibility. Uh, and being the first Qatar woman to do full Ironman, it's just uh, it's a feeling I cannot describe it. Thank you. Uh, goosebumps uh, is often what happens when you really dedicate yourself to a project. And um, Mr. Ahmed, you too have been dedicating yourself to a very important project, which is showing that Qatar is actually a very small country when you are running from north to south, south, north, east, west, west, east, 
on um, a pair of wheels. Could you also share your story with us? I was lost. Thank you. It's not a fun thing. Um, I want to thank Dr. Emma for the invite. Also, I'd like to thank the Dalek Humanities System of Science. Thank you, Jenny. So it's good being back. I feel like a family member. That's uh, a prayer that Moses said. God, allow me to be eloquent in my speech, but it's better my chest that people may know or understand what I'm saying. Uh, sermons are, I think, quite impactful because who we are, what we are, what the world, the reality that we see. I'll answer your question about me, but I feel like I'm not that important. I'm not that amazing to speak about. Uh, social justice means I think a lot to me. And when I was asked, reflected upon it and what it means and how sports plays into social justice. Uh, one of my childhood heroes, and still today my hero is Muhammad Ali, because he was the enemy of what social justice is and should be, and how sports plays a role in that. As an athlete, we create barriers constantly. So, Roger Bannister wrote the four minute mile. The uh, Indian Chogi broke the 712 marathon. Athletes are always pushing boundaries. And that's the important thing is what is human capacity? What is our potential? Muhammad Ali was a pugilist, he was a fighter. Fighting, I think, is quite evident. You're, you're an opposing force, you're standing in front of another man and seeing who's the better man. Uh, he began his career as a pugilist because of the social injustice. As a 12-year-old child, his wife was stolen. And he was so upset that he wanted to beat up the young boy who stole it. So he, saw, he, he, he searched for a police officer and he said, I want to kick his butt. I want to whoop his butt, he said. And the police officer said, well, you got to learn how to fight before you can actually do that. And that um, police officer actually coached a uh, boxing job. And that's how Muhammad Ali became a pugilist. That's how he became a boxer, because of injustice. If you look at Zalikov's so 1960s America, you're looking at a very, very racist country. You're looking at a country that discriminates against its own people because of the color of skin. Discrimination is saying you're not a part of our society because you're a female. You're not a part of society because you have a disability. You're not a part of society for any reason. Even though we're all the same species, we're all the same human race. But for some reason, we have this mentality of boxes where we say, you are not of the mainstream. Which is weird, because we're all here. We're all on this planet, we're all part of this planet, we're from this planet, we're on this planet together. So what Muhammad Ali was able to do through his career is amazing. 1968, 18 years old, he became Olympia, heavyweight champion of the world in the sport of boxing. Came back to his, his Hometown, asked to buy a burger. They said, We don't serve niggers. He took his Olympic medal and threw it in the river. Despite raising the flag and becoming the best in the world in 1960, he was still unable to be served in a restaurant. That shows you what social injustice is. But then it shows you also through his story what he was able to achieve. Later on, being having a world champion world. Later on, fighting for his right not to fight in an unjust war in the Vietnam War. He stood up for his right position against that war. So now being part of that war, he fought the largest and biggest country in the world, the United States of America, in the Supreme Court in one. That is the ability of what a sportsman has the ability to, do, to achieve. To represent Muhammad Ali was loved by all, but people loved him for his honesty and what he stood for. And that's what I believe social justice is through sports. What we're able to offer, what we're able to show, because we break barriers, because we are the pinnacle of something good and what human capacity and responsibility is. Okay, you have chosen. You have chosen to talk about Muhammad Ali instead of talking about yourself. But in many ways, you have seen in him a mirror of yourself, or you are mirroring yourself. 
on him. Uh, and in your own way, you too are fighting injustice by positioning yourself as an athlete, as a para-athlete. You um, are running, you are um, challenging, as you rightly put it, your own abilities. You are challenging yourself on a daily basis, not to prove society, but to prove something to yourself. Am I right in saying that? Definitely. We have chosen to take the other line, but I think somebody next to you will help us reflect about this. He's very humble, but he's amazing, actually. I get inspired by him. So yeah, I'm inspired by him. Yeah, you don't understand what inspiration he is to so many people who watch him. And even like when he done the latest race, the one that across Qatar, people were watching him amazed, and people were saying, he will do it. And, you know, I, I know Lulu was with him. I know that like, some of the people were running with him and supporting him. So sometimes he's so humble, but you're so amazing and you're an inspiration to so many people. I just want to add also, he is not only cross a distance. He fought against all the weather. And he didn't sleep for two days. He had given his will and second guess when and the wind pushing him backwards. I think other people would get smart and say we can go the other way where the wind is with us. But he was committed to his uh, plan and he wants to show us, I think he inspired me, he wants to show us, all of us, that if you plan it uh, and you have the will, you will achieve it. And I think that's more the toughness that inspired me. I'd like to take up uh, and underline what has been just said about you, uh, Ahmed. Uh, it is due, uh, and it is due to all athletes, because all athletes are running, and you've said it in, a different, in different ways. You are running as individuals, but you are running as partners with other team members. You are sharing um, life experiences while you are on the road. Um, if I may, I will drop the Mr's and the Ms's from now, um, because we are here to discuss human rights and we are partners in this race um, towards making humanity a little bit better. Um, Farhad. I know that during one of your expeditions, you experienced a death in the community, in the group. Somebody who was a mountain climber was with you and didn't make it to the top. It's a failure, a failure for the group. Um, but it is also an inspiration to continue. Because at that moment, you stop being an individual to be part of that team and to care for the team. My question to you is, how does sport create that sense of belonging, that sense of responsibility for the other, that sense of survival, not survival for the sake of me, but survival the well-being of my partner. Yeah. Actually, just to clarify, uh, first of all, whilst I will actually make it to the summit, and coming down, uh, unfortunately, there was another climber that was stuck on the ridge. She pulled crevasses. It was midnight, and we were already climbing for 20 hours. Everybody was exhausted. And he went down to help her, but unfortunately, his demon got stuck in the room, and unfortunately, he was rescued and he fallen. I think now his body is lost in the border between China and Pakistan. And uh, I think he's a very important person. He's Korean, from South Korea, because he climbed the 14 highest mountain in the world and he has no hands. He lost both of his hands in Denali in 1991, if I'm not mistaken, first by the accident. And actually, during that same night, uh, this is when I had my accident. I was lost in the summit. I was there struggling without oxygen. I almost died. I'm supposed to be dead now, but somehow I'm alive, you know. One way to prospect, and this is where I lost my fingers and that's why I'm not seeing it. But 
know, teamwork is very important in any sport. I mean, mountaineering, although mountaineering is more of an individual sport. However, certain and lots of big mountains, you cannot climb it with, without the support of different people. And in mountaineering, it's very important that sometimes you depend on your partner for your life. And for me, one of the issues I had that my partner, my guy, actually left me on the summit. And this is what a failure, you know, for him, he wanted to rescue his life. How about this affected my life? How about I believe that teamwork is a big part of the sport overall? And sometimes not even in individual sport, there's a big team behind the preparation, the training, and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to jump to the Um You were with Ahmed, you ran with him. Uh, and this notion of teaming together people of different abilities working towards a similar aim, what does this teach us? This teach us that really different elements. I think we had the serious element, he was so focused. I was playing around him, I was swinging, I was trying to cheer him. I was, uh, we had also another team member that makes sure he is fueled, hydrated, uh, have all his electrolytes in, and we have a team in the car where they make sure that the car, because we did it on road, so for his safety, we have a team that ensure his safety. We have teams that ensure about like distance and his like pacing. So we are all collective, um, just there for him for his achievements. And we, I still didn't get my payment. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, it's just out of uh, friendship and out of our uh, it unites us as sports. Uh, bring all people together and just like I said we are different elements but we all need each other uh, I think uh, we really have to respect that uh, I'm very humble to say that in my journey all in my journey from the beginning to the end I, I did train with the beginners and advanced people but I learned a lot I learned from the beginners and I learned from the advanced I learned from the coaches and I learned from People who are old and they just started, and people who don't started very young. I know many uh, these all elements collective are part of your journey. Uh, so I think they play an important role. And we are a sport united us. So me and Ahmed, I think we only meet when we are, we never meet for anything else. Absolutely. You have touched on uh, a topic that I want to pursue a little further. Uh, sports unites people towards a similar goal. Different people play different roles, but only the collective will allow you to succeed. And I would like to come back to address the upcoming World Cup. Um, in its own way, this has also been a race. This has been a movement that has is only possible because we have a collective of people, from the people building our stadiums, building our country, our roads, to the athletes uh, who are preparing uh, in the different countries, to the people, the hosts, uh, who are preparing to welcome all these people from around the world. It is a sports event in preparation, a sports race in itself. Um, what is the Supreme Committee and this country doing to secure welfare, to secure this notion of I am here to build this with you, hand in hand, in with social dignity, uh, guaranteeing that everybody is respected once again, the same uh, issue in their difference as a team member. Could you please help us to understand that a little? Yeah, of course. Uh, so one of the main things, and I think I, I touched upon it very, very briefly, but let me expand a little bit, is when we say legacy and when we say that we want to ensure that this tournament keeps a lasting legacy for the country and, and for the world, it's not in terms of hosting an amazing uh, tournament or having um, the game on the pitch set historic records or anything like that. So it is truly... The elements that we are looking for is, yes, the infrastructure of the country and building capabilities and the know-how, but also 
it's the social legacy that we, we aim to, to achieve. So our World Cup is actually the first FIFA World Cup that uh, instituted a joint sustainability strategy, something between us as the Supreme Committee for Delivering Legacy, FIFA as the tournament owners, and in Q22, the joint venture that is um, that is it, helping us exact the reality of the World Cup in Qatar. Uh, so this sustainability strategy sets out our... What, what we hope to achieve when it comes to this in all different areas, in areas of accessibility, in areas of environmental sustainability, in areas of the, what is the, the human impact we want to leave at the end of this. It's all outlined there. Um, and that incorporates the, a variety of elements. You're talking about our workers' welfare program and our commitment to the workers that are helping us build the world's health um, and the programs that we have done. I can, I can talk for hours about... Uh, just the the historic um, the historic programs that we put in place that complement the change that the country is seeing and the reforms that the country is making in terms of that topic. But this also expands to ensuring that um, we create an inclusive World Cup. And inclusivity is such a big word, I know, but um, it is something that we're hoping to achieve. Is we have reiterated this multiple times. Not only is everyone welcome in Qatar, but we are working towards ensuring that this is a safe and inclusive experience for everyone. Um, and that when they come here, they are here to experience the World Cup and our joint humanity is as a human race um, more broadly. So we're working on, on different levels through different initiatives to ensure that this happens. Um, and we've been working on this from day one. This isn't an afterthought. And the main purpose behind this is genuinely driven by the Qatar national vision that was before we um, before we even won the bid for the World Cup, before we even launched the bid in 2008, the groundwork vision was set out there and uh, our hope is to use the World Cup to catalyze some of the commitments made there so we can see them uh, in reality. And we've already seen a lot of them. Like I said, I can go on for hours and hours on this, but um, it, it genuinely is a true commitment, and I encourage anyone who's interested in learning more about this to, to look into our sustainability strategy. Um, and we've always ma maintained a spirit of transparency, so we report regularly on our progress, on where some challenges might be, and how we may look to improve them. But it, and I think this is reiterated by a lot of the people that have spoken behind me, the athletes from the, the, uh, from the athlete side of things in sports, is utilizing this as a platform. Um, but also utilizing the power of sports to exact all of these changes and put out all of these stories. Thank you very much. Um, we know that Qatar has been building this incredible infrastructure to welcome this World Cup, but uh, it hasn't been done without thinking about others. And uh, I've come to learn that part of our stadiums will be donated to... Um, other countries who may not have stadiums of their own. Uh, could you very, very briefly tell us about that initiative? Because it is social responsibility, it is guaranteeing that we are sharing our wealth with those who are less privileged than our own country. Yeah, of course, and this goes also towards our story about the Spiegel World Cup for the world. Um, the infrastructure that we have created is... To, the whole point of the sustainability of the infrastructure is that we won't need all of these sporting facilities post World Cup. Other will inshallah continue to host different mega sporting events and have to utilize it. But at this capacity, um, at least in the short term, it's not something that we would require. So, as a uh, not only a global player in sports, but also a global player in, in policy development, part of this is to donate. Um, the seats were, were built and the stadiums were built in a modular way that it could easily be donated after the World Cup. So to donate sporting infrastructure to the countries that need it most um, in order to share the game that might not be able to because of the infrastructure. And this is, yes, it's something that will happen post-World Cup, but we've been doing this as well with our Generation Amazing program um, in terms of building different sporting infrastructures around the world for marginalized youth. Um, and utilizing a football for development program to ensure that they are they are a part of this whole experience and that they have the infrastructure to help them um, to help them play and pursue uh, their passion for football, which includes specifically looking at their needs and adapting based off of that to to give them what actually helps them join in. Thank you. And if I may, I will pick up on your generation amazing initiative. 
and uh, address my colleague uh, Ryan Monard. You are involved in delivering uh, Generation Amazing um, initiatives as well for children, for, um, I think, trainers as well. Could you please tell us a little, because education also plays a very important role in changing uh, people's mindsets and approach to um, this very basic element of social justice. Ryan, please. Yeah, it's um, thanks for the invitation to walk. Um, but it's probably building upon what all the comments have happened. So Fahad and um, Martin, and then we're talking about putting a sport and infrastructure around the world for generation and maybe. So from our angle, we're looking at the mountains being taken to the community. How can we help them climb it? So from our background, QF and the ability friendly, we're trying to look at different practitioners and coaches and, and giving them the support that they need um, to deliver classes for all abilities. Um, we're in a fortunate position where we have wonderful support from people like the Institute Committee with Generation Amazing, with the numerous practitioners with themselves. Um, so we are looking internationally, but also we want to make sure that the community here in Qatar, that we um, we don't just have practitioners, but we have the best. So um, we're working closely around Hawthorne specifically at the minute. Um, but a topic I've spoken to maybe with a couple of people is with it's for all abilities. That's what we want to try and support and, and show that football, sports, swimming, mountain climbing, talking about football, yeah, making sure that it is successful for all what it should be. I'm from the UK, I'm from the capital of football of Liverpool, which I would say. We have an amazing footballer called Mohamed Salah. We're talking about the Arab world and an Arab icon. Um, and we want to showcase that I'm, I can use that as a way, as a, as a tool to say, why shouldn't we, everyone want to represent the country, but two, like the, the achievements that everyone's been speaking about here. We want to give that platform, and whether you're Muhammad Ali, whether you're a big blind footballer, and we want to give you to the, the opportunity to represent your country, to even maybe not even so much represent your country, but also have that opportunity to play sports. That's limited there sometimes, and it's different. Um, what I notice sometimes, the more challenging the needs of the player is or the person in sport, then I will have the provision, and we're fortunate here. But we have that opportunity to change that and utilise and work closely together. To, to... Mm -hmm. Uh, your program, uh, Ability Friendly Sports, is specifically directed to children with disabilities. Uh, you've just mentioned that um, at this stage we are focusing in autism, uh, but you have plans to expand, uh, to offer training opportunities to children with other profiles. Could you tell us a little about that? Yes, yeah, so we started to live in classes for different uh, participants, but the educational side, um, we delivered in workshops, just raising awareness around disability, our sport can be adapted slightly. Um, then with Generation Amazing, we have specific inclusion modules, um, with a focus around autism for a day, visual impairment for a day, and a couple of other abilities. Um, but working closely with the wonderful yourself and uh, with this institute, um, we're hoping to develop coaching and coach courses starting next week, inshallah, after 12 months of, of delays because of COVID mm -hmm. and other things. And that was used for everything. Um, and we want to try, and we're starting mainly around autism. And prime example this week, um, fortunate to work closely with Al Noor Lions Institute, and we started delivering classes there. A good group of children taking part. And straight away, you could notice the technical development of them. Now, the point of what we're trying to do is if I'm not here, coaches that have a wonderful team, if they're not here, then things should not stop. And that's what we're trying to put in place so that there's a platform for coaches to continue to learn, continue to practice. And that's where we want to go. We're going to concentrate around autism over the next couple of months. 
then we'll look at the blind community, offer them a provision and become practitioners and coaches and give them the platform that we need to develop and that's what we're pushing towards. Thank you. So talking about education and the place that sports uh, plays in developing young minds and young personalities. Um, if I may ask the four athletes in uh, our panel today, um, when and how do you feel sports should be introduced in the life of a child? And how do you see it happening for those children who are not normally seen as mainstream or, for some reason, are not found in that particular sport? And I will be talking about girls playing football or boys dancing ballet or iron men, iron women. Um, how do you feel that education should be moving and um, taking our children into this opportunity of learning through sports? Could I uh, pass the word to our swimmer, please? Um, so I think, honestly, yes, I mean, like, education was brought up. That's the number one most important thing, I feel. And um, you know, children sh should start from a very, very young age. Um, but of course, it comes from first educating the parents, you know, um, allowing them to know more about uh, the importance of sports, a healthy lifestyle, healthy living. Um, so I think, yeah, it definitely comes from educating the parents first so that they are able to encourage their kids, um, you know, to adapt to a healthy lifestyle, to promote a healthy lifestyle, to live it in a healthy um, So I think that's how it should start. I totally agree, yes. Yeah. So back to that, I think schools play an important part because uh, the school is where the kids spend almost 50% of their time every day. And I think with uh, like, yeah, what is called now, uh, PE or other activities, it's important to introduce both genders to different kinds of sports. And sometimes you can spot early talents in kids by knowing first they have to be interested in the sport, and then you can have natural talents in the sport. So I think schools play an important part of it, and also summer camps and different activities that the community centers within those neighborhoods can have. So I think it's very important to expose the children to as much variety of sports as possible for them to know whatever they like the most. Because sometimes a certain culture that they throw the boys only for football, for example, or volleyball or basketball, while kids may want to explore other types of sports. And the same with girls, wanting to explore the games that typically boys are doing. And also, I think it's important, which is uh, something that's less in uh, the Arab world, is people with uh, special requirements in terms of sports and other. Uh, currently, most of the area, we don't have accessibilities for those uh, or facilities that's designed for those uh, segment of the community. And I think this is an area of focus that should be focused more by uh, regulators and by uh, schools and community centers within the region. Mm -hmm. Ahmed, um, as an advocate for social justice that you are, could you tell us how you would inspire children with, dis with disabilities to also engage in sports from a very early age? We're still talking about education here. I guess that the best probably could be discover your abilities, not focus on the disability. Um, you know, but it's the only country in the world that's a And I think that shows the importance of what sports is and what its impact on the lives it can have. Um, children are born with disabilities all the time. But they don't know that. So, you know, Kalami, Kalami says, for instance, he's visually impaired. So he's a, it's part of his characteristics to be visually impaired. An individual who has a fruitful and, and fulfilling life. He plays sports, he works, he has a family, he has children. And I think the domestic kind of sports, developing your body, your skills, your abilities, and not focusing on, oh, well, I'm in a wheelchair. 
and have more focusing on other aspects of your life. It's confidence builds, um, trust in your abilities, it builds um, an identity that's not shaken by just certain sort of attributes that people might put on you. And it's like anyone. I mean, you need to be sports from a very young age. I think uh, one of the sports to put children is swimming. You throw a baby in the boat. And the thing about babies is they, because they're, they're in the womb, they you know all the grass. And from there, you can develop other sports. Running, playing, all these things play against the body and creating tension and creating uh, strength. And like Brad said, you, you develop, you explore, you see what you like, what you don't like, they see that potential. It might be a career in sports and it might be just a hobby. But sports and the impact it has on lives is amazing. People like me, I have, I have a physical disability, which was by an accident. So because I'm an athlete before, my recovery was far better than someone who had never been an athlete. And those are the small things. Like, I never knew, okay, because I played basketball, because I ran, because I played these sports, that it improved my quality of life after my accident. But that's the truth. There's research that shows that athletes recover far better than individuals who were not athletes before. It's because you build a process, which you know there is a process. You begin here and you end up here. Start at day one, you learn the technique, you learn the skills, you learn your body, and you focus so on and so forth. You keep moving up until you reach your goal. You don't reach your goal, you reapproach your training, and you see how you adapt. And those skills are built. It's not, oh, I'm the world champion day one. No, you went through a process, and that process changed and made you understand who you were. And that's the importance of, of sports and that transferable knowledge into other aspects and areas of your life. So sports is important. It's a hadith in the, in the Prophet that the most famous about how Allah teaches the children both back riding, swimming, and archery. Those are basic skills which are important at that time in terms of traveling, fighting, swimming, all these skills which are transferred in other areas of life. It creates focus, it creates endurance, it creates so many things, and I think that's what we need to focus on in sports. Absolutely. Never tell me. <laughs> Thank you. What about being a young girl and wanting to go into sports in a professional I way? think if I have to say one thing, it's you're never too young to start. You're never too old to start. Just start where you are right now. And it's a journey. It's a self-discovery journey. Uh, and it's a journey where there's a lot of failure. But it's leading only to successful path. Uh, so that's my my quote. Um, but for women who try to find a uh, professional in sports, for for example, I use myself. Uh, I get um, a lot of permission to pursue this as a professional, and then I don't. I didn't take that um, because only I want to show. Uh, to all doctors and mothers out there that I'm just average girl. I am not a elite athlete and I don't need to be a elite athlete or be that Olympic professional sport to practice sport. Uh, as Ahmed mentioned, it is transferable skill. Anyway, uh, I remember me, I learned self-discipline. I learned how to uh, stay consistent. I learned to trust the process and not to give up. And that had uh, sharpened my skills in many um, aspects of my life, whether it is in my career or uh, my side project or in uh, my public relationships. I realized that sport, um, whether you learn from sport, you, that skill stays with everyone. So I don't want people to look sport as it's one way road, whether I take it professional, I am either a good runner or I'm not gonna run. You can be average runner and still be a runner. Uh, you just have to do it. And I hope everyone practice sport every day, regardless uh, what's your title. You can be a mother that does sport, you can be a teacher that does sport. You don't have to be an Olympic to do sport. You don't have to be a professional to do sport. You don't have to have a label. I hope everyone practice sport. I think um, uh, sport really sharpened a lot of uh, skills inside of you. It's a healing process as well. Uh, I went through my healing journey, and sport really helped me. It's like uh, it's like that. So I really recommend sport for everyone. Good. Uh, thank you. Uh, could you tell us what it means to be a woman? in sports 
an Arab woman swimming uh, help us understand if you have ever felt discrimination, if you have ever felt that because you are a woman, you have been at a disadvantage in any way? I mean, honestly, putting like women and sports together, you know, it feels so powerful, right? I mean, the Lord can quote me on that. Um, you feel unique, yes. <laughs> it's uh, just minority. Hopefully not for a long time. Um, you know, it's, um, as much as I love the sports for me, I just want to be able to um, tell all the women out there, to all the girls from younger generations to um, to go for it, to be passionate about um, to, about what they love, you know, to take risks, to go out there, to not be sort of failure, um, and to just go out there and do it, honestly. Um, women can do schools, you know, women can be whoever they want to be. Um, so that's honestly what I would have to say. And it's, it's really nice knowing that uh, you know, I have succeeded uh, throughout my journey. And you have little uh, girls coming up to you and saying, I want to be a swimmer like you one day. I want to take up the sport. And to me, that, that means a lot to me because you know, it shows that you know, I'm, I'm on the right path and um, you know, promoting sports and uh, helping my son. Is it more yeah. difficult because you are a woman? Um, I would think maybe he can say because in the sport, a lot of evidence, statistics shows women better in endurance. Am I right? Can you? Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. I, yeah. I can tell, like with statistics, women are better in endurance. I finish my race and I can go back. Right. I think boys. I <laughs> My big thing is trying to push around disabled women access in sport. That's what something that we're trying to be the one. Female only activities that we're delivering. Something that, yeah, same type of, type of idea. How do you break them barriers down? How do you offer a vision and a showcase the achievements for, you know, going, oh, well, she's a wonderful female athlete or he's a wonderful male athlete or whatever. They're a fantastic athlete, and same with disability. I think the time has come for us to take a few questions from our participants. Uh, could we please? I've selected a few questions, but how looks like they can see the questions that are being asked. One of the first questions that were asked by our participants was, do you feel that there's a difference between the support given between female and men within the same household? Or female athletes, were you? Did you feel like your main counterparts were pushed more into sports while you were, as Dr. Joe said at the beginning, you were more pushed to do more feminine things? Uh, asking me, uh, if, and my answer is absolutely. <laughs> it's not just in the household and community. Also, uh, when I first finished my Ironman, I didn't get um, congrats from many, as my colleagues did. But that didn't um, pull me down. I just want to show that uh, regardless of anyone, like your achievements, your dreams are valid, your uh, vision of yourself are valid. So just go and do it. And if it's meant, if, like if it's, you're meant to be um, celebrate, it will happen. We just have to do it and just try it. So with the support or without the support, I think, that's what I, I, maybe I'm biased because I'm a woman. I think women are very stronger than they think they are. They are beyond uh, incredible athletes uh, because science proves that. And uh, just I, I wish uh, I could encourage another girl to take risk and try to achieve and follow their dreams. Mm -hmm. Would anybody else like to add anything to this question? Do households tell boys to be athletic and girls to be dainty uh, and stay home? Sitting I was a woman last year, <laughs> 2020, and when I joined you guys last time, the social justice, I believe so. But there's also contributing you know, causes to that. I think a part of this nature, not all girls want sports, combat sports, endurance sports. 
And if they do, they want to pursue other avenues. I mean, swimming is well in that sport. One of the most successful Olympian or Paralympian is actually a swimmer, female swimmer. She has almost 50 uh, Olympic medals, which surpasses what Michael Phelps has ever done. It surpasses so many other athletes. And that being a woman, I think you are a minority, even though you're not a minority. You're a minority in a society where you're a majority, but you're treated as a minority. And those skills which you learn how to circumnavigate the world as a woman are transferable in sports, and that makes you successful because you're always you're the underdog. No matter how successful you are, you're the underdog. You're not a champion, even though you are. And I think those skills are not as well pronounced. That's why I think a lot of what supports women in sports. Uh, my mother's a physician, a surgeon. As a female surgeon, she faces so much discrimination. And it's the same for every surgeon. The only surgeons which support other female surgeons are fathers of surgeons. Then they think they are equal to male surgeons. And it's only because his own daughter changed his perspective. And I think that shows uh, how we're programmed and how we see the world. And I think that needs to change. Because capacity is not based on gender. It's, it's based on the world and actions to do the thing itself. Not all women want to be doctors, not all women want to be Olympians, not all women will want to be in sports, but the ones that do have that support. And sometimes you're not given that support because it shows our filters out the ones who just want to kind of play or get something easy, or successful. If it's not, we'll change the avenues. Sometimes you need that, that test of the will and commission to pursue your goals. And that's what makes you better. It's that fight. Okay, so it is not so much what others are allowing you to do but what you set yourself to do you are in a way saying it's up to the women to decide what they want to do how they want to do when and in what conditions and to teach the rest of the world that they are here to decide could we take another question please this was one thing mr ryan from our experience with children do you have any advice for young athletes who are only focused on winning rather than actually achieving something or pursuing themselves? Um, I think it's building upon the conversations that we just scared upon. Like, I'm truly blessed. I have a little boy, a little girl, um, and I want them to achieve what they can, what they can do. Hearing about it makes me sad because I've got a young girl through five, and the, the challenges that. Some people are talking about it, yeah. That'll break my heart if I don't know she's gonna she's gonna tap on face them. So for me, the priority is if we can get those to just to participate in sports, concentrate on recreational activities, um, creating that environment, which is what we try to do here, um, then we can build upon and sign and guide people, technical and and develop them in different ways. Yeah. That's the best. That's, I can only echo what experience I've had and been fortunate to see across the world. So that the best way is just creating a platform for everyone and then we can move forward towards that. I've worked with some footballers, for example, who've gone off to play in the Olympics and being super. But I think that I've been footballers and then I've, I've worked with some children where yeah, I think of a blind, blind player that we used to work with. Never spoke for four or five years when we got to see them. And it was like, for us, that was the biggest, the biggest achievement of someone to go and represent the country because we created that platform. And then, that, and then if the instrument who's as talented and got some great athletes here, then the environment hopefully will be there for them. I hope that answers the question. If I may move the needle just a little back to the upcoming World Cup. Um, we are preparing to welcome diversity once more. I'd like to know what Qatar is doing to welcome persons with disability during the upcoming World Cup. Um, would you please let us know a little? Yes, of course. So this is actually one of the core pillars for our sustainability strategy, is to ensure that they are not only welcome, but their journey is as smooth as possible. And, and we're talking about disabilities across the spectrum. We're not just talking about physical disabilities. 
but also looking at people that might yes. uh, that might not be most comfortable in stadiums. Let's say it is a very loud, um, potentially triggering space for for different individuals. So we are looking at different programs like sensory rooms that would allow them to experience the beauty of football, um, but in a way that caters to their disabilities. In terms of um, accessibility more broadly, the stadiums operate under FIFA standards for accessibility. And we have already seen this during the FIFA Arab Cup and during Club World Cup and the past and how that functions. Uh, so it's definitely a core consideration in our preparations, not only in the infrastructure, but also in the operations in the, in the fans' journey. Um, to ensure that it is accessible for everyone that wants to come and enjoy the game. Uh, I know that during the Arab Cup, uh, a number of activities and solutions were tested and tried for the first time. Among them, we had a live audio commentary of football games for blind uh, audiences. And uh, I'm actually very proud to say that uh, CHSS played a major role by allowing um, training to happen here um, for those very people who presented during the Arab Cup. Uh, Nada, uh, sorry, uh, I just gave you a different name, Rama. If you could please tell us a little bit about the experience um, what happened uh, during the Arab Cup? Because the first time uh, such a solution was used in the Arab world, am I right? Thank you, Dr. Jadida, for your question and for having me here in this uh, inspiring uh, panel discussion. Uh, we had uh, the audio descriptive commentary. We provided the audio descriptive commentary service for partially uh, sighted and uh, blind people in the Arab Cup. After having a two months of uh, training here in CHSS, uh, we tested the service and uh, gladly it was uh, a success after hearing from those who attended the, the games and who uh, used the service in order like, to get a chance to enjoy the game just like the others. Could you tell us how did that work? How did blind people get to see? the game through the descriptive commentary. They, uh, they use an uh, application in their phones. They used to tune in from that application. Uh, and they used to listen to the commentary, uh, all the descriptive commentary provided by the commentators who we train here in uh, CHSS. Uh, they just have to download the application and they can immediately find the, the audio descriptive commentary right there. Describing everything happening on the heart. Very interesting. You say that um, they would hear the description of the game. Um, how can you describe a game to the point of making it visible to those who cannot see? Okay, so uh, this is different than the regular audio description as it focuses more on the movements directions of the players on the board itself, where is it going, uh, what's going to happen now, uh, the players, how they're behaving, how they're focusing or not, and all of this, in order like to just share the same experience with, uh, with their friends and family and to know what's happening, what's going to happen next, and all of this. Mm -hmm. um, a gender question. We talk about football, and normally we connect football to men. Uh, and when I think about commentating football games on television or the radio, once again, we hear men. Um, is this um, a male-oriented service? Uh, it, it's not a male-oriented service. Uh, the program is open for, the training program is open for both genders, students and males. However, we had a difficulty in recruiting uh, female commentators. Maybe uh, not everyone is interested in football, I mean, the females in Qatar. So, uh, hopefully, this time, uh, as we're going to host the program again in uh, March 19, uh, hopefully, we will see more women engaging and uh, helping to provide this service for partially sighted and blind 
outcomes. So here is a call uh, for men and women out there who would like to support the World Cup um, being an audio commentator during the games. But I also know that um, you didn't only provide audio description for the games. And it's slightly different when you are audio describing the opening ceremony, for instance, um, and that was uh, delivered by women. Yeah, it was, uh, we provided audio uh, descriptive commentary, uh, yeah, audio description for the opening ceremony. And it was provided by a uh, woman, and these women were aware of uh, our students uh, who were trained how to audio describe in our early visual uh, master's program here in the College of Human Rights and Social Sciences. So, yeah, everyone can join and everyone can provide uh, service. So clearly, uh, sports is not about men, not about women. It's about um, just doing what you can do well and doing better, pursuing your dreams. Uh, it's about the athletes. It's about the games, the experiences. It's about the fans. It's about the venue. It's about... Um, celebrating uh, achievements, it's about pushing um, you to your limits, and in all of this, um, how does sport contribute towards change, towards the future? How are we as individuals involved in sports at such different levels some of you are athletes, others are coaches, others are audio describers, others are preparing the World Cup, um, carrying the flag again, bringing flags in again. How are we contributing towards eradicating poverty, uh, stimulating um, social engagement and responsibility, uh, stimulating gender equality, um, I'd like to hear each of you with a message to the future. How can we um, make the world a better place through sports and through what we are doing as individuals? This is a moment of silence where we are all reflecting. I will get something. <laughs> Please. So the words of Ham Dai. You know that the most book. This message for the future generation. I think it's a befitting way to uh, that end. So, champions are made in the gym. Champions are made from something deep inside. Desire, a dream, a vision. They have skill and will. But the will must be stronger than the skill. You don't really lose when you fight for what you believe in. You lose when you fail to fight for what you care about. I'll win the people who quit. When they feel discomfort. I'll run the people who stop because of despair. I'll run the people who are delayed because of prejudice. I think we should underline that. Prejudice. I'll run the people who surrender to failure. I'll run the opponents who lose sight of the goal. We should underline the goal. The goal wants to always be there. Because if you want to win, the world can never retire. The world can never stop. The faith can never weaken. And I think that's where we can start sometimes when we find that despair and when we stop. So faith, I think, is very important. You have to have faith that as an athlete, you see that goal. You see yourself on top of that verse. You see yourself an Iron Man. You see yourself at the end of your goal. And because you see that goal and you see that potential of a better tomorrow, that's why you pursue it. 
the betterment of humanity, it's not just in sports, it expands to all realms of our life. The athletes, our players, and all, all players, as Shakespeare said, the world is the stage, and all its men and women are players. And we have many roles in life, we have our interests, and our interests. And if we see life as that, I think we, we know that we're more than sportsmen, we're actually players in this life. And the Prophet said, Mental Amunka, the right of the he who sees something wrong should change it with his hand. And that means everyone is an active member of society, changing it for the betterment of society. And that's what we need to remember. Because God said, We will not change the situation of the people until they change it themselves. We are the players. We don't have to wait for a miracle from God from the sky. We have to do it ourselves. And that's what we need to do as humans, as players, as sportsmen, as individuals. And it didn't say men or women, it said everyone. Humans, humanity. Absolutely. It's just so scary how we want to send the same message. Again, just uh, to add uh, above everything he said, don't wish for changes. Be the change you wish you want to see. So don't wait for the right moment. Don't wait for the right person to show up. Don't wait for the time when it's right. Don't wait for the free time. Create time. Be that person that you want to be. Be the change you want to be. And stop from now and don't, it's, it's just like a diet sport. You cannot just go full on diet because then you will binge. You go running, you start 10K, 5K, 10K. You don't go, go full marathon. That's when you injure yourself. Um, and I just want to say to any girls that are watching me, I know it's hard. Our society makes it hard for us to practice our sport. But trust me, you have the whole support. You have us all back. We're just waiting for each other to show. So when I'm telling what I'm passionate about, what we're doing, I didn't only get supported, but I actually got many great opportunities. And being here is one of the opportunities after I push hard beyond my limitation. And that's just to show you that there is a lot unknown. It's only when we step to that out of the comfort zone. Thank you very much. Uh, the last words from this group, inspirational words for the future. I think honestly, sports brings everyone together uh, from different backgrounds, different cultures. Um, when it's just so diverse, and it's lovely to see, you know, that we're all here to inspire change and make a difference um, for the future sports. And honestly, um, um, all that is amazing and provides such amazing opportunities when it comes to facilities, when it comes to, you know, just the support that I think, um, you know, everyone should make use of that, should make use of such wonderful opportunities and uh, a message to all of the young girls out there, follow your dreams, be passionate, that's the most important thing, honestly, is passion. If you love it, you should go for it. Um, never give up. And honestly, don't be scared of failure, get back up again and do what you love them. I can guarantee um, this is for, for everyone. And there will be mountains to climb. Yeah. <laughs> We're waiting for the first athletic woman. <laughs> To climb a mountain to the next. I think from my side, I think the groups kind of very well. I was touching two things inspiration and failure. You know, I think it's one of the most important things that sports men and women can do is inspire others. Because people get inspired by stories. And not everyone has Everest to climb. Like everybody has his own Everest, you know, either it's finishing a marathon or finishing a book or like graduating from university or even buying their first house. So everyone have their own mountain to find. And I think uh, the stories they see from people around inspirational. And the thing that actually it's uh, the best thing for an athlete. For me, I failed to climb mountains. And the failure was the fire that made me go up, you know. And one thing of the failure is uh, maybe similar to Ahmed or but sometimes acquiring an injury or Having uh, an injury that can prevent you from doing the other sport, like doing the other climb and losing my fingers. So, anyone else will think, okay, maybe finish, you finish your hobby, you cannot continue your climbing career. But for me, actually, it pushed me more. For me now, I have another mountain to climb. However, now I have a new challenge. 
and other challenges. So it's just inspiring, like how you can do better, or how you can inspire others by your story for them to be better people or better versions of themselves. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, each of you, for being here this evening with us. You have definitely inspired us, and I hope everybody feels equally inspired. I can only wish Qatar an amazing year ahead, an amazing World Cup. Um, the youth of Qatar, um, I hope this is an opportunity to grow into sportsmen, sportswomen who have mountains to climb and their own flags to carry. Uh, whatever success may mean to each of us may be a success that will reflect on humanity in general. So thank you again, everybody. And I truly enjoyed this conversation with you. All the best.